from West Virginia Public Broadcasting. Support for the legislature today is provided by the following. West Virginia University. Online at wvu.edu. The High Technology Foundation, headquartered at the I-79 Technology Park in Fairmont. Online at wvhtf.org. At the legislature today, the House passed a Senate bill relating to deer farming in the state. It's an issue that's been around for a while. In the Senate, the Health Committee amends a bill about immunizations that gives the state more control over exemptions for vaccines. And we'll check in with legislative leadership for an update at the midway point on the legislature today. Good evening, I'm Ashton Mara. Senators approved five pieces of legislation and sent two on to the governor for his signature. The Senate passed the House's amended versions of both the CPR requirement for high school graduation and a bill that expands the use of a drug that reverses the effects of an overdose. The upper chamber was also set to amend and put to a final vote a bill to repeal the state's prevailing wage today. But the GOP's plans were thrown off track by one Democratic senator's request. Senate Government Organization Chair Craig Blair, who is Senate Bill 361's lead sponsor, stood to offer an amendment to the bill on the Senate floor. Blair's amendment would keep the prevailing wage in place, but alters the way it's calculated. The current calculation is done by the State Department of Labor through a survey sent to all contractors asking them to report the wages they pay employees. Instead, the amendment says the estimate would be based on the average wage rates calculated by the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics and the average rates paid regionally in West Virginia. Rates would be calculated annually by Workforce West Virginia in partnership with the Centers for Business and Economics at West Virginia and Marshall Universities. The amendment also exempts all public improvement projects under $500,000 from having to pay the prevailing wage. Senator John Unger questioned Blair about how the agreement was reached. We were in here all day Saturday and then came back in and met again on at 1.30 on Monday afternoon. And it's one of the parts of the process that I was actually very, very, very pleased with. And that is we brought members of the, that were of the interest group, so to speak, together to discuss what was going on. Blair said both labor and business interest groups came together with members of the majority and minority parties to discuss a compromise, but Unger questioned the closed door meetings. Last Thursday, um, you stood on this floor and you had indicated that that this amendment, that this bill would be amended by the body and not a committee of 14, not a committee of 17, not a committee of three, that the body as a whole would be able to amend this bill, work it through, work it together in front of those cameras, I think you pointed to. If that is the show we want, that's great. Again, this is an open government to where everybody will have an opportunity to participate in not just the half of the Senate, but they come here and participate as a whole. So I'm just wondering if these meetings were not open to the public, press were not present, and this amendment's drafted, how could that be open government and open to the whole? How, how would you justify that? Well, the, way, the way I'd say that right now, you can get any amendment you want in here today, right now. Nothing precludes you from doing that, Senator, as well as anybody else in this chamber. Unger went on to call Blair's amendment an extensive rewrite of the bill that members were only able to view just five minutes before the floor session. Because, he says, senators and the public weren't given ample time to review the amendment, Unger moved to have the bill and the amendment lay over until Friday before putting it to a vote. After a break in the session and negotiations between both parties, Senate Majority Leader Mitch Carmichael stood to speak against well, Unger's just, motion. This delay will not add anything to the process. It just, everyone is here, we're ready to vote on this, we've discussed it, we have reviewed it, we have talked about it from both sides, all interest groups, every party involved. That's what we do here, we make decisions. We, as much as we'd like sometimes to put them off, 
and have another reason for making a decision, that's what we do here. We make decisions. And uh, somebody won't be happy about it. Somebody will be happy about it. But at the end of the day, we're making public policy. And, you know, that's what we're paid to do. Blair also opposed the delay, saying members of the minority party who hadn't seen the agreement signed on as sponsors of his amendment, including Senate Minority Leader Jeff Kessler. Kessler says he was not included in the weekend negotiations, but was advised by his attorney that many of the compromises Democrats were looking for were contained in the new language. Still, he says, it doesn't hurt to delay consideration by a day. I agree with the senator from Jackson. This has been, and also the senator from Berkeley, this has been a very volatile, hotly contested, and important piece of legislation that all the eyes of West Virginia are on. I see nothing to be gained by running it through here this, after, this morning, Mr. President, and having it sit another day so that the people of this state can know that their voices have been heard, that they have had an opportunity to see it. Not me, not the senator from Berkeley, not the senator from Jackson, but the people of this state have had a chance to see it. I see no harm. At this late day, we're not at day 59, we're on day 30. With plenty of time to get bills out, it can still get out of here before the end of the weekend. So I would urge the adoption of the motion. Unger said providing the extra time is a common courtesy for him and his fellow senators, but a vote to approve his motion was defeated 16 to 18 on party lines. I ask unanimous consent, excuse me, that further consideration of Senate Bill 361 be deferred to the foot of bills on first reading. Senators did not vote on the bill during their morning floor session. Instead, they recessed until 5 to give members more time to look over the changes and come up with their own amendments. The Senate approved the prevailing wage bill as amended by Senator Blair this evening on a vote of 23 to 11. The topic of deer farming has returned to legislators' desks year after year, but it's never been passed. There's a disagreement between the Division of Natural Resources, which oversees wildlife, and the Department of Agriculture, which oversees livestock. Liz McCormick reports that now the issue is resolved. Senate Bill 237 was on the House floor today. The bill would create the Captive Servid Farming Act, which would allow West Virginians to own farms to raise deer and elk. The bill would transfer regulation of these farms from the Division of Natural Resources to the Department of Agriculture. Delegate Brent Boggs of Braxton County opposed the bill, not because he opposed servid farming, but to express concern with the switch of power over the law if passed. Department of Agriculture has wonderful facilities. They've got labs, they've got a state veterinarian, they have a lot of different things. But their expertise is not in wildlife. They, they do a wonderful job with livestock, with food safety, but their expertise is not wildlife. That's where DNR comes in. Over the last few months, there's a new DNR director, and uh, I would like to have had the opportunity to see how a new director working in conjunction and in cooperation with the Department of Agriculture, how we could make this industry grow, but still protect the concerns of the hunters and the sportsmen and the sportswomen from around the state. Delegate Bill Anderson of Wood County supported the bill and spoke of the many farmers who would be able to use their land to be able to sell meat in the state. They want to employ people. They would like to be able to sell some venison to the Greenbrier, or to the Bavarian Inn in the Eastern Panhandle, or to the Blennerhassett Hotel in Parkersburg, but right now they can't. Oh no, that's bad. And so those facilities and numerous other ones that might want to sell venison, they have to buy it from Pennsylvania or Ohio or New Zealand. Senate Bill 237 passed 88 to 12. During the closing remarks in the House, delegates stood as they do every Thursday to give a jobs report for the state. Tuesday, the Berkeley County Economic Development Authority made a big announcement that a large Procter & Gamble facility would be built in Berkeley County by 2017. The company expects to hire 1,000 construction workers and over 500 permanent jobs. Delegate Marty Gearhart, a Republican from Mercer County, stood to speak on this news. We have reports of some success attracting business here in West Virginia, success from my friends up in the eastern panhandle. We have a manufacturing plant that should bring great success and be part of a successful 
circumstance, Procter & Gamble is moving to Ber Berkeley County, and I'd applaud that. The timing, though, is interesting, and I would question whether or not that plant wants to locate here because of conditions from the past, even conditions today. I wonder whether or not they're locating here because of what is being created and where our state is going in the future. Delegate Tim Miley of Harrison County dispelled Gearhart's notion. Now, I know my colleague is, is in sales, um, but if you fall for his line that this facility decided to come here because of the rosy picture from the November's elections, then he would be a pretty successful salesman. This, this negotiation started long before the November elections, as did the decision of the uh, Odebrecht Company to come to West Virginia in Wood County as did Southwest Energy to come to West Virginia to take over Chesapeake's uh, assets and to drill more here, as did the companies that are located at the Clarksburg Air, uh, Bridgeport Airport that provides a billion dollar economic impact. And while our, our colleague and friend from the 27th chooses to focus on a glass, glass being half full, I choose to focus on the glass being, excuse me, half empty, I choose to focus on the glass being half full. And as I've said on numerous occasions, that's not to suggest we don't have problems in areas of improvement. It's only to suggest that we have a lot of positive things occurring in the state. For West Virginia Public Broadcasting, I'm Liz McCormick in the House. Coming up, we'll check in with the House Speaker for a progress report about this session. First, here's a look at some of the bills introduced in the Senate today. Among the bills introduced in the Senate today, Senate Bill 459 provides for the construction of a statewide fiber optic broadband infrastructure network known as the Broadband Middle Mile to be purchased and owned by the state. Senate Bill 460 to clarify the procedure for a child witness to provide testimony in a criminal action where the child is a victim and when his or her testimony cannot be reliably obtained in the presence of the defendant and Senate Bill 478 to generate and maintain funds for highway construction by raising taxes on motor fuels, raising the consumer sales tax, and dedicating the additional proceeds to the state road fund, raise fees for motor vehicle registration and salvage, driver's license, and document fees of the Division of Motor Vehicles, and to establish a state infrastructure bank and state infrastructure fund. Among the bills up for passage in the Senate tomorrow, Senate Bill 302 to add the West Virginia Municipal Police Officers and Firefighters Retirement System to the definition of retirement plan as it relates to disqualification for public retirement plan benefits. Senate Bill 315, relating to civil actions filed under the Consumer Protection Act, the bill provides that courts be guided by the policies of the Federal Trade Commission and that no award of damages may be made without proof that the person seeking damages suffered an actual out-of-pocket loss. House Bill 2200, revising and recodifying laws relating to child welfare. The bill was recommended for passage by the West Virginia Judiciary's Court Improvement Board. It's the product of a bipartisan effort to streamline child welfare laws in the state. And House Bill 2201, to provide a definition for net metering and requiring the Public Service Commission to adopt certain net metering and interconnection rules and standards. Net metering is defined as measuring the difference between electricity supplied by an electric utility and electricity generated from a facility owned and operated by an electric retail customer. On second reading, Senate Bill 378, relicensing electricians without retesting under certain circumstances. Today marks the halfway point in this 60-day legislative session. Republican leaders have been pushing bills through both chambers at a vigorous pace as they work against the clock to get their pieces of legislation approved. Joining us this evening to discuss their progress is House Speaker Tim Armstead. He's the first Republican to lead the House of Delegates at the current state capitol. Mr. Speaker, thanks for being here. It's great to be here. Thank you, Ashton. We should say that the Senate President was scheduled to join us, but they went into that evening session and right. kind of went long, so he wasn't able to be here tonight. But I do want to start with talking about that prevailing wage bill sure. that passed, that was that amended and approved. Um, I realize you haven't seen all of the details yet, but do you think that this amendment, this compromise they've come to, is something that the House is interested in? Well, I think the House, and, and I haven't seen all the details of it, I've talked to uh, some of the members of the Senate about it, previously and today, 
Uh, and certainly we'll look at that. I think that there is certainly a great deal of interest in, among the House Republicans in addressing this issue because we're talking about taxpayers' money on these projects. We're, these are public projects, so any dollar that's spent on them is taxpayer money, and we want to make sure it's spent efficiently. And you know that doesn't mean we don't want people to be paid fairly. We certainly do. But at the same time, we want to make sure it's a fair, a fair rate that for both the taxpayers and the workers who are doing these projects. So there's a great deal of interest in looking at this. I think there's a, a, a number of our members who would like to see that just completely eliminated in terms of repealing prevailing wage. But there are others who I think would be interested in looking at this, this compromise. So we'll, we'll have to see what comes from the Senate and, and uh, discuss it with our members and put it out there to the floor and have that discussion. I'm sure there's plenty of more discussion to come. Absolutely. Let's talk about some bills that have already been passed this session, and I want to start with the Pain Capable Unborn Child mm -hmm. Protection Act. We know your position, we've heard your position, but the fact mm -hmm. is courts across the country have said a 20-week ban is unconstitutional. This bill is a 22-week ban. Depends on how you define the term, but they're saying we can't approve that, that this is unconstitutional. Does the legislature take into account the court costs and the legal fees that may come with passing and uh, passing a piece of legislation like this. Well, first of all, let me say I don't believe it's unconstitutional. Uh, I think that there are no, there are actually a number of states who have passed legislation similar to what we passed. That that those are the laws of those states right now. They haven't even been challenged, and so I don't believe it's unconstitutional. Whether someone will sue over a piece of legislation is is always a possibility. No matter what you do. Uh, there may be someone who thinks that they don't they don't like it. They think it's a, it, that it's unconstitutional. So that's that's a possibility in a number of pieces of legislation, and and certainly we take that into consideration. We take an oath to defend the Constitution, so we don't take that lightly. Uh, but I looked at this bill. I've looked at the law in other states. Uh, I looked at where we are right now in terms of the law, and I don't believe this is unconstitutional. So uh, and, and let's keep in mind what we're talking about here. Really, to get to the core of this issue, we're talking about unborn children who are capable of feeling pain. The medical evidence shows that they're capable of feeling pain. And I know we can have that debate, that discussion, different people differ on that, you know, that, that issue. But I think that's the core of the issue. And I don't believe the people of West Virginia want us to, uh, to continue to have abortions be legal where that child can feel pain. And there's obviously an ongoing debate and discussion throughout the country about this. The Congress of the United States has, has, uh, has previously the House of Representatives acted on a bill similar to this. And, and I believe that this is a sound piece of legislation that will really protect uh, those children from, from having that horrific pain. That being said, the governor has vetoed a similar piece of legislation in the past. If I can ask you kind of a technical question, sure. what's the timeline? It's been single referenced in the Senate, and I'm assuming they'll approve the bill, goes to the governor. What's the time frame if you all want to overturn a veto? Well, under our Constitution, if we are still in session and a bill goes to the governor, he has five days, five legislative days, to, uh, to act on that bill. So uh, we anticipate this, will be, this bill will go through the Senate and that it will go to the governor in time for us to act if he chooses to veto it. Having said that, it's not our goal for him to veto it. We made some changes in response to the, uh, to the uh, concerns that were raised in this veto message, but at the same time we wanted to stay true to what the purpose of this bill was. There was a suggestion about going to 24 weeks viability. That's not what this bill is about. This is bill is about the capability to feel pain. So we stayed true to that principle of what we wanted to accomplish, and at the same time, tried to address some of the governor's concerns about the penalties that the doctors would suffer. And we did talk about the difference between the calculation, the way you calculate 20 weeks and 22 weeks. So I believe we have made some changes to try to address the concerns he raised, even though I believe the bill we passed last year was constitutional. I believe this bill is. So I hope the governor will sign it. I think. Uh, we did try to address some of his concerns and stay true to what we were trying to accomplish. Let's move on to a bill that was debated and discussed a lot in the House, and it's one that you don't usually hear much about, the Commissioner of Labor and what his qualifications are. The bill that was approved was this person needs to be somebody knowledgeable in employee, employer interests in the state. Who brought this to the legislature's attention? Why did we need to take on this issue? Well, there were a number of people who believe that the way our code was written, um, we have both labor, both uh, employees who are both in unions and not in unions. And we just felt that if we have a 
person whose role it is in state government to look out for em employees that it shouldn't be only labor employees, only union employees. It should be someone who has a background uh, that that could could deal with the issues that might come up in both labor and non-labor situations in terms of employees. So that's all this was. This simply says that uh, this person will have em employee relation background. So that can still be a labor representative. It, it may not be, but uh, I mean in terms of a union representative. But it will be someone, it will always then be required to be someone who has worked in the field and, and realizes what workers deal with every day. So when you were on this show earlier this session, there were, you said the first 15 bills were the priority. We've moved pretty quickly through those first 15. It was some tort reform, some education bills, uh, the Naloxone bill, which was being sent to the senator, or excuse me, to the governor today. What's the next big push? Well, I think there are a number that we've been discussing that within our caucus, and we've been talking with Republicans and Democrats alike. There, we still want to continue to look at areas that can move our state forward economically. And, and a huge part of that is our education system. And of course, we've heard a great deal of discussion about Common Core and the standards that we have in our, in our school system. So we're gonna we'll take a pretty good look at that, a pretty, uh, I think, comprehensive look at that. And there's some legislation I think will we'll be coming forward soon relating to that. Uh, some other issues in terms of, of ethics. We want to, to look at ways that we can ensure ethics integrity in our government. Uh, so there are, there are a number of different issues that we fought for for many years that were not necessarily in those first 15 bills. But let me say this, I think, the, I think the, uh, there's a tremendous amount of good in those first 15 bills, ways to really move our state forward, to really uh, help people be able to, to work here in West Virginia, to raise their families, uh, to educate their families in schools that have the kind of flexibility and talented teachers that we need. So I, I'm very pleased and excited about the progress we've made in the first uh, half of the session. There's a lot more to do, uh, but, but I, and, and a number of those bills have either passed one house and are still being considered in the other house, so there's still a lot of work to do on those bills. But uh, we're very excited about where we are now, and uh, there's a lot of energy there, there are a lot of, of our members who just feel like, okay, let's move on, what's next? Because they feel like we're really making progress. Well, Mr. Speaker, thank you very much for coming back and joining us again this evening. Pleasure to be here, thank you. A Senate committee approved an agreement today that would modify the way immunization exemptions are granted in West Virginia, taking the power from the county level and centralizing it at the Bureau for Public Health. Members of the Senate Health Committee initially received a bill that would have allowed parents to seek religious exemptions from some immunization requirements. A committee substitute offered last week removed that exemption, but members still had concerns and asked for more time to work on a compromise diversion. That compromise bill was presented Thursday. The committee substitute requires a family doctor provide the Bureau for Public Health with a request for medical exemption. The request would then be reviewed by a new chief immunization officer officer within the Bureau. The bill also sets up an appeals process for parents who disagree with the immunization officer's decision. It can first be appealed to the commissioner for the Bureau for Public Health and then to state court. Dr. Raul Gupta, commissioner of the Bureau and the state's chief health officer, says he's satisfied with the new bill. This is uh, obviously a good attempt in ensuring that the issue of inconsistency is addressed while keeping the, uh, the strong immunization policies intact. Um, and, and, and I think that's a, a really good step forward. The bill was approved unanimously by the committee and now goes to Senate Judiciary for further consideration. Now here's a look at some of the bills introduced in the House today. Among the bills introduced in the House today, House Bill 2711, to provide for a scratch-off game to fund a drug treatment facility in Mingo and Logan counties. House Bill 2713, to provide taxpayers repaying their own student loans a modification reducing federal adjusted gross income and in the amount of the interest paid for personal income tax purposes. House Bill 2715, to make it a misdemeanor to transport a minor across state lines to obtain an abortion without written consent by both parents or legal guardians. 
House Bill 2717, to provide transparency in the process of hiring employees of county school systems by requiring the school board to be informed of all persons who have applied to fill vacancies and the detailed qualifications of each applicant. House Bill 2718, to transfer funds remaining in the Racetrack Modernization Fund to the State Road Fund and closing the Racetrack Modernization Fund. House Bill 2719, to increase the penalties for participating in an animal fighting venture. The bill takes it from a misdemeanor to a felony, increases the fine from $1,000 to $25,000, and increases the jail sentence. There are no bills up for passage or on second reading in the House tomorrow. This has been the Legislature Today. We welcome your comments. You can email us at feedback at wvpublic.org. I'm Ashton Mara. Thanks for joining us. Good night. Support for the legislature today is provided by the following. West Virginia University, online at wvu.edu. The High Technology Foundation, headquartered at the I-79 Technology Park in Fairmont, online at wvhtf.org.